Welcome everyone to the 92nd Fireside Chat with Tom Campbell. I'm your co-host Adam Hashin with the always lovely Donna Aveni. We have a wonderful chat plan for you guys today. I encourage everyone to participate if and when you can. Although we tend to like general questions, don't let that hold you back from asking something entirely personal. It just won't likely be included into the YouTube recording. Now, if you're still watching from the sidelines out in YouTube world, there are so many ways to get involved with the MBT community. I recommend getting on the mailing list, pop in on a Saturday open house on Zoom. There's even in-person groups all over the world. So there's more ways than before to get involved. So with that being said, let's get right into the questions and I'll pass it back over to you, Donna, for you to introduce the first one. Thank you, Adam. That was a great introduction. And thanks about mentioning the uh, open house and our, and our mailing list too, and joining the fireside chat. We do have some new people, so welcome. The first question is gonna go to Ursula and Marla, and these are on a relationship. Hi, everyone. Hi, Donna. Uh, hi, Tom. Uh, so Marla and I are going through similar relationship uh, dynamic with men. Um, these men look to us to alleviate their emotional pain. Uh, the question is, how do we navigate through these relationships with love? How do we support them? And without getting triggered ourselves? Well, it's easy. <laughs> We know it's it's really easy to understand how not to get triggered yourself. All you do is get rid of your fear. And then, of course, you will never get triggered. But getting rid of all of your fear is not necessarily an easy thing to do. It's part of you. Most of people's fear, they've been walking around with it since they were toddlers, and it's a bit hard just to drop. So here are some suggestions. You should try to to um, you know be careful about the way you put things. Okay, so people who are in pain and people who are feeling miserable and people who are looking for help, they don't want to be told to straighten up and fly right. That just makes them feel worse. And this doesn't matter whether it's male or female. You know, this is just addressing to to people who, who are, are hurting. Uh, telling them to suck it up cupcake is generally not helpful either. It just makes them feel worse. Then, then they not only have whatever pain they have, but now they start to feel bad about themselves. Um, starting sentences with the word you is something you should avoid. Instead of you do this, you always do that, you never do this, whatever it is, it's much better to not start out with a you, because now you are, you know, pinning something on somebody, you're telling them how they are. And that's never helpful, telling them how they are. If there's behavior that they have that you don't like, don't say, when you do this, you know, that upsets me. Or you always upset me when you do this. But you can say, when, when this happens, here's how I feel. And then you tell them how you feel. And if you can, why you feel that way. So now it's not a blame game. You make me, you know, you make me feel bad, but when this kind of behavior happens, or when I hear these sorts of things, whatever it is, this is how it makes me feel. You know, I have triggers to that, or I have connections to that, or I, you know, here's how, here's how I interpret it. And then you can give them an interpretation. And what you'll find out is that males and females are so different that they don't mean the same things by the same words a lot of the time. They don't, um, can we say, they uh, tend to miscommunicate a lot. A man will say one thing, a woman hears something different than what he intends. 
The same thing with a woman says one thing and a man will hear something different than what she intends to say. So be careful about how the other person feels, how they get what you say, how they interpret it. It's not important so much that you say something that's clear in your mind as it is that you say something that then is clear in their mind so they know what it is you're saying. And the best way to do that is just talk about your own feelings. So when they're talking to you, you can talk about your own feelings. And it may be that that stuff, that you, when you say that, it upsets me, and you tell them why it upsets you, they may be just as surprised as they can be that that's the case. They just don't really understand. And for, you know, for most of our lives in relationships, we have this problem with communication. We just don't communicate. We're like ships passing in the night. We know the other one's there, but we just don't say much. We have issues. We have feelings. We have hurts. We have, you know, we have pain. And we just keep our mouth shut. Endure it and go on. That's kind of the lesson that we get out of our culture, particularly for most of you at the age you are. That's the lesson you get out of your culture. Suck it up and go on. Let it go. Well, what happens is, with all the miscommunication that's between males and females, an awful lot of water goes under the bridge that's totally um, misinterpreted. And we build up pictures in our mind of the way we are and the way people are. And those aren't necessarily the way they are at all. So I'd say the first step, is besides not starting sentences with you and you know talking more about your feelings, things that that other person does that, that you don't like, explain them in terms of, of how you feel. Not that that other person's wrong, because that just gets them their back up, but this is how it makes me feel. So start communicating. Start being honest. Start saying things pretty much the way they are, but saying it in a nice way that's non-accusatory by explaining how you feel. Like I say, why you feel that way, if you, can, if you can also dig that up, is also useful. So talk about yourself. Ask questions. How does this make you feel? When I say such and such, how does that make you feel? Find out how what you say makes the other person feel. If you're not getting that, if you're if you think you know, but you're not really sure necessarily you know, then ask. <clears throat> so that's called communications. Talking with somebody else, sharing who you are, finding out about how they are. And that's something we're very, very poor at particularly across the male-female boundary. We're just not good at being honest and straightforward because we think that if we are, it'll cause a problem. If we just say what's on our mind, it's going to be an issue. But the good thing about communication is it solves most of its own problems. In other words, if you're straightforward, then it may turn out that Indeed, the two of you are kind of incompatible because the things that uh, the other person really likes and loves are the things that upset you, and vice versa. Well, that's two people who are incompatible, and they should probably, you know, find other places and other people to be with, or realize that it's always going to be this way, and certain subjects and ideas and the ones can't be talked about. And then it's a accept it and go on kind of a mode, which is really not all that healthy. Much better if a relationship is just fundamentally not a good one is to find a better one. Okay. Now, a lot of relationships that seem like they're fundamentally not a good one, it's just a whole lot of miscommunication going on. They actually, there's more there that could actually work well, but it's not being accessed because everyone's afraid to start something because everybody likes to avoid conflict. Conflict, oh no. 
I won't go there because that's conflict. Better to air the conflict. Be honest about it. Try to be reasonable about it. But if it's just the way you are and the way you feel and and you think that's fundamental to, to your being, then say that. Your partner, if they, you know, have value the relationship, will look at that and say, oh, this hurts my partner. I need not to go there. I need not to be that way or act that way or say those things or talk about her mother that way or, you know, whatever it is. I need to just stop that because it hurts. You see, but if they don't know, all they know that when they do certain topics, you get angry. And as soon as you get angry, they're angry that you're angry and you're angry that they're angry. And pretty soon the, the fact that it had anything to do with your mother is lost. Nobody even notices that that had anything to do with anything. So the whole issue is kind of sweeps under the rug and, and it's no longer there. So now you're arguing about arguing. Yeah. How dare you fuss at me? How dare you fuss at me? And it, you know, it just keeps going that way uh, without ever actually getting down to what's the problem. So I'd say, be honest. And what I mean by good communications basically solves problems, that if you're just being honest, this is the way I feel, and no matter whether that's rational or irrational, doesn't matter. You don't have to be able to explain it. All you have to say is, this is how I feel. If that other person doesn't take that into consideration, then that's not a good sign. That's not a nice person. Nice person interested in a relationship will take that into consideration. You see? So if you're just honest and you tell people not how they should be, you need to stop this, you need to stop that. Now you're telling somebody else how to be. And even if it's absolutely right and correct, whoever you tell that to has their back up and doesn't like it because nobody likes being told they're wrong. Nobody likes being told how they should be. So that's why you never start a sentence with you, because that's just bound to fail no matter what the subject is or who's right or who's wrong. It's just, it's a failure, you know, to start. It's destined to fail. But if you talk about your feelings, important feelings, and you share those and you, and you share them honestly, and there's no, there's no, uh, retribution in it. There's no, oh, look what you make me feel. You know, it's not that. It's just, here's how I feel. Just an honest expression of feeling. And if the other person does the same, then a whole lot of things that are now between you, but kind of secret because nobody ever talks about them, will come up. You know, both partners need to do the same thing. One partner being honest is helpful, but both partners being honest is golden. And if both people will do that, and I'd say within a couple of months, you'll decide whether this relationship is really, you know, worth putting time into and fixing and straightening up, or whether it's time to move on. It's, uh, it's you know, it doesn't look like it's salvageable. After all, when it's all said and done, you need to like each other. You need to see each other as a person that you want to spend time with. You don't want to spend time with people that don't want to be there. And you don't want to be there. That's not, that's not a good life. You know, you can have, you can say, well, you know, you're, you're my spouse, you know, it's your, it, it, it's required that, you know, you come home to me, uh, you know, every night by six o'clock, because that's what spouses are supposed to do. Well, if somebody doesn't want to come home to you, would you like to force them to? Would that sound like a good relationship? Not exactly. Can you fuss and holler at it and, and guilt them into, into it, and then that'll make it okay? Of course not. If somebody doesn't want to be there, then you just assume they not be there, because if they don't want to be there, then you don't really want to be with somebody who doesn't want to be there. You see what I mean? 
So this honesty thing just kind of takes care of itself, kind of figures out who's who and what's going on, gets everybody straight on the same language for the same sorts of things, cuts through most of the miscommunications and, and gives you a good assessment about what your relationship's all about. And don't be afraid if it turns out that the best thing for you to do is to start over. Don't look at starting over as a, oh my God, I don't want to go back, you know, through that circus again. You know, that was so traumatic when I went through it the first time, you know, that's going to be awful. Don't look at it that way. It's just life. Live it. Enjoy it. If other people come into that life while you're living it and enjoying it, well, good. You may like some of them, you may not. Just let things happen the way they do. It's not something you have to go out and fix. Just be. Do things that you enjoy. Do things that make you smile. Be with people that you like. And don't worry about partnering up. All of that happens by itself. And in so much as you chase that and want that and are after that, you won't find it. It will hide from you. It'll slip around the corner. It's just out of reach, but, uh, you know, it just doesn't seem to ever work. And when you just let it go, not make it what you're doing, make it that I'm just going to live a life and do the things that, that I like. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to have friends. I'm going to go places and do things, or I'm going to stay home and, you know, tend the garden. You know, it doesn't matter, whatever. Okay, you should pick out some social things to do because so being social is part of being human. So if what you really want to do is stay home and tend the garden, you're an introvert and you don't really uh, get along with people all that well, you should still pick some social things. Join a club. Do things together with somebody. Join some kind of gardening organization, you know, you like to stay home and garden, well, join some group that gardens. Go interact with them. Have some social time with people who are in, have interests that you do. Enjoy life. Have fun. And the coupling up thing just happens all by itself as long as you don't chase it. If you really want it and chase after it, it's just as slippery as Teflon. It's just it just won't seem to happen. You have to just let it happen. The reason it doesn't seem to happen is because you're not acting just the way you are. You're acting now in a way that you aren't in order to make a certain result happen. You're very conscious about what should I say and how should I look and all this sort of stuff. Well, that's your image. That's not you. Well, great. Somebody really likes you for your image. Now what are you going to do? Now you got to play image, you know, all the time, 24-7. You know, that's no good. You don't want to play image all the time. Image is what you do for people you don't know very well and you're just getting to know. You know so be yourself. And if it works out, it works out. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. Don't worry about, you know, dress the way you feel comfortable. Do the things that make you feel comfortable and just be that way. And then the people who want to come back around and back around again, well, it's because they like you just the way you are, not the way you present yourself, not your image. You see, so being straightforward, being who you are, just living your life, having, having fun, connecting with people, the, the, the finding relationship will occur. And if it doesn't, then connect with more people. Join another gardening club, too, you know. Have more people. You're just not seeing enough people. But you're not doing that with the idea, oh, when I join this next club, I'll find somebody. Let's say, oh, look at them. Maybe, maybe that's it. You know, let me go find out. No, no, no. That's the wrong way. Just go enjoy. Connect with people and let all the let all the chips fall wherever they may. That's much more uh, profitable than going in there with an idea that you're going to find somebody or make a connection. You may not. It may not be 
an, another month or another year before that connection walks around. Sure enough, if you're just true to yourself, live a good life, stay happy and enjoy yourself, that will come around for you. And if it doesn't, well, poke the LCS and say, hey, don't forget about me. You know, here I am out here in my garden all day long, you know, just I'd like to meet some different people. And then maybe you find out that you get involved in a something else that you're interested in. Maybe it's grafting Japanese prune trees or something, uh, some other kind of a, of a thing that takes you to a whole different group of people. Or maybe you get interested in, in uh, doing things that are, that are volunteer. You know, maybe you get on board with Meals on Wheels or holding preemies in a hospital. It doesn't matter. Just do things. Be helpful. That stuff will make you feel good. Volunteers, so there's lots of things to do. Lots of places where volunteers are necessary, where you meet other people. And there's lots of places probably in your community that, that uh, try to help adults gain high school educations, learn to read and write. You know, adults that somehow miss that step. Well, there's a certain number of adults that fall into that category, and they go to these schools, and it's almost 100% volunteers in these schools. They don't pay teachers to do that. People volunteer. So you probably find out that there's hundreds of things you could volunteer for just in your own community where people have needs. And every one of them, you'll meet other people. And guess what? You'll meet nice people because these are people who care enough about other people to volunteer their time. So it's already pre-selection. The only people there are people willing to help other people by giving up some of their own time. So you already start with nice people. <laughs> you know, the opposite's also true. If you want to meet nice people and the way you do that is go to a bar, <laughs> that's probably the wrong place. You know, no, Not that nobody ever meets a nice person in a bar, but that's probably the least likely place you know, that you're going to actually find this this uh, individual that you're looking for, because you have a whole bunch of people there who are mainly very self-focused, trying to accomplish certain ends, and it's uh, not so likely. So I took a long time with that, because you said we're going to talk a lot about relationships, so I just thought I'd, I'd let that roll for a while, because that'll answer a whole bunch of questions across the spectrum of, of uh, about relationship. If the relationship isn't good, you need to find that out. If it doesn't have potential, you need to find that out. But if it has potential, then you should find that out too and start working on that potential, particularly if you've got investment in it. Then work on that potential. What are the things that you could do to make it better? Don't say, what are the things that the other person could do to make it better? Because that's just creating more problems. Say, what are the things that I could do? to make it better, and then start doing some of those things. Okay, so that's it, and then let it go. If it turns out that there's no potential in it, then it's a good thing to let go, not to keep picking at something that doesn't have potential. And if you see that there's oodles of potential in it, but you can't quite break through to that potential, then you need to have to say, why? Is it, is it the, you know, the, the communication problem? Well, you can only lead that. You can only change your own behavior. You can't change somebody else's behavior. And the more you try to change somebody else's behavior, the worse things usually get. Other people have to change their own behavior. Now, you can explain things to other people, but they have to change themselves. But always explain in terms of your own feelings, not of, how you make me feel. That's throwing a guilt trip. That's blaming somebody else. So just say, you know, this is the way I feel. And explore that a bit. And I feel that a lot lately. And I felt it this time, and I felt it that time. And, you know, you may have your own reasons for that, and I, I'm not saying that what you're saying is wrong. I'm just telling you, how I feel. Keep it neutral. You see, 
So anyway, those are some hints and, and ideas. And if you find that there's very little potential in the relationship, then it's time to form new relationships. If there is potential, work on it. You've already got a lot of time into it and there's potential there. You just have to figure out how to get along in better ways, how not to push each other's buttons. Then that's something you can work on. That's a work in progress. Think about it in terms of potential. Where could this relationship go? Where is its possibility? And if, if the answer to that question is nowhere, well, it's time to move on. If it's like, well, there's potential here, then work. See if you can get that potential out. And then if it doesn't work out, you can always feel like you did the best you could to develop the potential of it. And it still just didn't work rather than, well, I just was tired of it, so I decided I'd do something else. See, that doesn't leave you feeling very good about your choices. That's not a good reason. All right. That was really great. And don't knock bars, all right? I bet my wife at a bar, so. <laughs> <laughs> all right, our next question, we're going over to Michael Sangeski uh, with a follow-up from Will. I think they have kind of a related question about um, experiences in an out-of-body state. So I'll pass it over to Michael if you want to ask your question yourself, Michael. Yeah, so this question is about uh, exploring the non-physical and um, being taken places that weren't really your intent. So mm -hmm. as an example, when I'm exploring Tom's Park, you know, if I'm kind of still in it, doing a bit of my imagination, I can kind of go back and forth with the LCS. But if I keep doing that, eventually I'll find myself, okay, I'm not imagining anything anymore. Um, but when that happens, I uh, will typically just be somewhere else completely. And I'm like, oh, well, I'm not in Tom's Park. I intended to be in Tom's Park. I was working that Tom's Park thing for, you know, quite a while. But when I finally kind of let go, I'm not in Tom's Park anymore. And I don't know if that's just my intent kind of waning or if it's just the LCS saying, hey, this is experience is going to be the best thing for your growth, even though I feel like, well, why not have that be in Tom's Park? And kind of a, a related thing, um, speaking to, I've, and I've spoken with other people in the community about this and they experience a very similar thing. Mm -hmm. And even if it's not Tom's Park, like let's say they want to go to the Eiffel Tower or the pyramids or something, and that's kind of their intent, they'll get to some sort of a tower or some sort of a pyramid, but it's not like the place in kind of a, as it looks like in PMR. So yeah, just wondering about that. Okay, that's a good question. That is the way things do happen. That's a good thing. It's not a problem you're having or it's not a failure of you know your own uh, focus on Tom's Park or anything like that. That's indeed the way it works. You have some initial idea of what you want to do and why you want to do it. Often the LC has, has a totally different idea about what you need and what you and what you should be doing, the experiences you might need. You start off in Tom's Park and then you end up somewhere else. That's good. And that somewhere else may not be the destination either. That may be just a way stop going someplace else. So you, you get there, you investigate wherever you are. You look around, say, well, what's here? What's here to learn? Anybody else live here? <laughs> and, you know, there are other, other people around, or am I here by myself? And then just kind of think for a minute, what's, is there a lesson here? What can I learn in this space? And if you find a lesson, fine, then go work that. You can then ask the system, you can say, is there a special lesson that comes with this place? Something I should get here. Nothing happens. Well, you might just then find yourself some other place. You're done with that one. So now you're at place three. And you go through the same thing there. You say, all right, where is this place? What's it like? What's its nature? Other people? Is this a social place? Is this just me? What should I learn here? And how's it different than the last place? Was there any connection? 
Is this just a repeat of the last place? So I'm getting it again because I didn't get it last time. So you can think of those sorts of things. And you might say, well, maybe it is, but I'm still not getting it. Oh, let's say, uh, hey, let's, let's give me something a little easier. I'm having a hard time figuring out, uh, you know, what this is, uh, what I should be doing here. So you can have a running connection with the LCS as you go. And you'll probably go off and get in another place. And I'd say that looking back at my own experiences when I was about where you were, ending up in five, six, seven, eight places in one outing, typical. You're all over. You jump from thing to thing to thing. And it's not by your volition. It's just let it flow the way it happens. Just let it go however it happens. See what you can learn there. Now, the fact that you look for things to learn, look for lessons, and the lesson may be inside your head. Everything you need to learn the lesson may already be in there. It may not be a place-related lesson, in which case every place that's just quiet and thoughtful may be the right place for you to be. Then you can start thinking, what is it? You know, what do I need to deal with most? When you're in that mode of questioning and open to lessons, well, the OCS can hardly help but, but butt in and start giving you lessons. So things almost always tend to happen. And even if it takes three or four hops before the action starts, usually you will start learning things. Now, on the opposite end of that, you can go with very specific things in mind. All right, today I want to, uh, I would like to travel to some other body in this, in this, uh, what, uh, virtual reality that has beings in it, or in some other virtual reality. You can make it inside the, what we call the physical universe, or you can say, and I'd like to go to some other virtual reality that's sort of like mine, but different. I'd like to see how it works. I'd like to compare it with mine. Get some sense of its history and, and how it works. And have that as the thought. So you can pre-plan, pre but it's about a 30% chance that you'll end up doing just what you pre-plan and about a 70% chance you'll end up bouncing around doing something else. You take, you take your lessons where you can find them. Sometimes you'll get done with a session that's taken an hour or two and you pop, you've popped around to three or four or five places. And at the end of it, you're really not quite sure what any of it was worth. But then you still think about it and say, well, you know, what was to learn there? Was it just how to get there and stay there as long as I wanted to? Was it, you know, was I, was I learning skill? Was I learning discipline? Was it all about discipline? Was it all about just being and just have a meditation there, whatever the place is? Is it just a matter of just being and the place is irrelevant? What, what was it? And be open to learning anything. And then you'll, you, you will find that more time than not, the places you go and experience will be interesting. They will be something where you're learning. Sometimes just learning discipline is, is the right lesson. That's what you need to learn. So not much happens there other than you're sitting in a space and you're just supposed to be quiet and open and do that for, you know, 30 minutes. And that's good discipline all by itself. Good thing to be able to do. Nothing actually has to happen. So that would be the that would be my advice. Natural, Michael, that's the way it goes. You bump from place to place. Some of that is your own mind, not staying necessarily tuned to one thing. It's sort of like a thought buzzes through your head and pretty soon you're off someplace else. That's okay. Don't worry about that. It's uh you, you learn more through 
through seeing and going a lot of different places than you do from just going to the same place a whole lot of times. Now, Will, did you have a follow up to that? It, it sounds like you're really, your question is right in line with that. Actually, I think I'll just ask my other question instead because yeah, it was pretty close. Okay. So, um, so Tom, uh, I guess um, my my question for you is I, I had a question about uh, parallel processing. Okay, so so I, I'm now at the point where I have uh, basically figured out how to parallel process. Okay, mm -hmm. and so I've got my little man, and he's out there, and he's walking around in a field. You know, I'm able to do that, but I literally have no idea what to do with it now should i just like kick back or i was what my question is it's actually do you have any suggestions uh as a some play of getting a facet or starting up um uh in hindsight from uh, parallel processing well just practicing that and and being you know in two frames at the same time is a good exercise just all in itself that as you know if you've gotten that far you didn't get that far on the first day. You know, it's some, it takes, you know, it takes a lot of effort to do that. Um, I would say continue that learning with more and more difficult places. Um, try to sit down in a busy place full of people, you know, a, a big mall someplace where there's hundreds of people walking around and a big background roar going on all the time from all the voices. And try to do that there. Now, now, let your little man out and have him, you know, walk around the mall in the parking lot while you sit there, or uh, have him, uh, or you, go take a walk in a park someplace and let the little man sit sit in the mall, you know, to take your to take the place of your body. Let him sit sit there, um, whichever. But learning to do that in in more difficult circumstances will will build. Uh, what we say, uh, a sort of toughness about your, you know, your states and your ability to stay in them. So that would be a good thing to do. Otherwise, if you're stuck inside and it's a really nice day, let part of yourself go outside and enjoy the sunshine. That way you can do both. Just... You know, I'm sure most people get into into little crunches every once in a while that they wish they could, you know, put themselves in a duplicating machine and have another of them because there's so much work to do. It's hard to get it all done, or because they need to be in two places at one time or something else. Well, use it for that sort of thing as well. Be outside when you have to be inside. Uh, be tending to to somebody. You got to. You know, your your mother's sick or your Aunt Susie's having a problem. Well, go look in on them. Go talk to them. Uh, do something helpful like that for somebody while you happen to be waiting for your bus. So, yes, you have to pretend, you have to pay attention about the bus or you'd miss your bus. You need to look at every bus. You need to read what it says on it. You need to keep track of time. So you need to be there at the bus station paying attention but you can be someplace else at the same time doing other things that are maybe just being helpful or just pop in on your sister or brother to find out how they're doing. So there's a myriad of things that you can do with it, but practice it. Get more, the word I was looking for is robust. Get more robust in your altered states to where you can, under almost any conditions from any environment, you can go almost anywhere you want and do so successfully. You can go from a crowded, busy, noisy environment to a peaceful place. And then you can sit there and enjoy the peace and really feel relaxed and peaceful as you sit on the stump by the lake, you know, listening to the frogs croak, and you're really sitting in some, you know, mega store with, with uh, you know, chaos all around you. Let the chaos disappear. You go sit on the stump at the lake for a while because your wife's shopping there and she'll come get you when she's done or, you know, whatever else. And you can find that you can get, you can walk out of that megastore 
feeling relaxed and refreshed because you spent most of the time at the lake rather than feeling bombarded and you know attacked from all sides like you sometimes feel when you're when you're in chaotic spaces so does that help will give you some yeah, ideas of things to do that's really great tom uh, thank you i really appreciate that tom our next question will be from armand go ahead armand Thank you. Uh, okay, Tom, my question is about remote viewing again, uh, but this time uh, it's about how the data is processed from the database to the free will awareness unit. And I will read the question because how the data enters the free will awareness unit seems to be determined based on our programming of the avatar and who we are, our experiences, and so on. The brainwave state also seems to play a role. For example, if you are remote viewing and are in a beta brainwave state or in a theta state. And I will read an example from a crime case I was helping out with. Uh, after deep relaxation routine with binaural beats in my headphones, I got several impressions and feelings of the target. Small parts flashed in my mind's eye visually, but it was difficult to interpret the, the data I was getting uh, when the session was over. Then I went to bed and I, when I woke up uh, in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and, and went back to the bed, I decided to remote view again while lying in the bed. I just thought about the target in half second and suddenly I saw video snippets in a 2D perspective of an event that took place for like five to 10 seconds. It was very clear and it was shown like in an old computer game from the 90s and pretty much answered um, what I think was behind the target ID. So my question is, could it be that it was the same video snippet that was trying to show itself for me during the day when I was remote viewing? but I just saw kind of like blurry flashes of it? Or could it just be that the data couldn't get in any other way? Uh, so it was showing itself for me in an other way than this video. So my core of my question is how can one uh, be more accurate and be faster in remote viewing? Because sometimes I can spend two hours to, to uh, the remote view a picture of a volcano and during the night sometimes I, I just see the target in one second so yeah yeah the difference is that when you wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and then lie back down your mind is relaxed and pretty much empty it's not racing it's not processing it, it just woke up from a state that it wasn't doing any of those things so your mind is, is in a very receptive state. And then because you were interested, because this is a project you're working on, the idea floats by and says, oh, yeah, well, what about that? I saw that fuzzy stuff, but what about that? So you ask that kind of a question. Well, that's a query. What about that? What was that all about? And bingo, it comes in real perfectly clear. The reason it's clear now is your mind is clearer now. And it wasn't so clear then. Your mind wasn't so clear then. When you were doing it the first time and you got little bits and pieces, but none of it really gelled to anything that you could describe, that's because you were wanting it to do that. You were reaching for it. You were trying to make that happen. When you get up in the middle of the night, you're not trying to do anything other but mostly go back to bed. Then the thought just goes through your mind in a flash and Bingo, you got it. You're not really trying to do anything. It just happens because your mind is open and focused on that information because it just comes by. So training to be a remote viewer is all about getting into that second mindset whenever you want to rather than having to wait until you have to pee in the middle of the night in order to get into it. You know, you, you need to want to be able to put yourself in that automatically and just be open and whatever. Well, when you do, then you'll be a better and better remote viewer as you can do that. 
But that's something that, you know, takes just a lot of practice to do that. So it's not anything about the way data moves or anything else. It's just a, it's just a matter of when you are relaxed, open, and basically your mind is empty of anything else. And the question flashes through your mind. And bingo, you get this, you get the story, you get the video. And when you're saying, okay, now I gotta get the picture. Okay, what's this about? You know, and you go in and you try to do your thing and make it happen. It doesn't happen like that so much. Sometimes it does. Sometimes you just have to be, you're just in the right mood for it. You're just in the right mood. Okay, you know, I got this, and you're feeling very confident and you open your mind and there it is and you get the picture and all right armani the great remote viewer you know and it works fine but other times not so much other times you want it you people are standing around saying all right armani tell us what you see you know and there's a bunch of people standing around expecting you to do something and of course that's the time when it's hardest to do anything at all because that interferes with your ability just to let go and be so it happens the next night you know, and one of the things you can tell people is, well, just let me sleep on it or, you know, let it let it go for a day or two. The stuff comes when I'm relaxed, not when I'm sitting here with a bunch of people staring at me waiting for an answer. You know, so just ask people to give you some time. Uh, it, but some remote viewers get to the point that they can just empty the mind, step up to it, open it, and they get it. But they didn't do that the first 10 or 20 years that they worked on it. They did that after a whole lot of, of uh, effort to get to that point where they can let go that completely on cue. It's not so easy to do. It's very different from what we learn and what we tell ourselves and how we're supposed to be in our normal life. We're supposed to be alert. We're supposed to be thinking about what's going on and what's supposed to happen next. We're supposed to be responsible we're supposed to, you know, get our work turned in on time. You know, we've got all these things that our culture tells us we learn, you know, it's part of our psyche. It's just hard to drop all that stuff, just drop it in a basket and, and not, not deal with it. But with practice, you can just learn to drop it and let it go. And it's funny that you can, you can sometimes create tools that enable you to do that. Like some people uh, will learn, let's say they are uh, uh, not uh, looking at crime scenes, but they're looking in, uh, to interact with dead people. So they learn that when they interact with dead people, the thing you do is just kind of see the dead person. They're just there. And that that always works. So that's their tool. It's sort of like Tom's part. You start out with your imagination. Your imagination says, well, there's going to be a dead person up there ready to talk to me. And you just kind of let your eyes roll up a little bit and start talking, and there they are. You see, that's just like Tom Spark. Lead with the imagination. The imagination, within a few tenths of a second, turns into the reality of you're talking with the larger consciousness system and you're in the database. But you start with your imagination. And because you've done it 10,000 times, you're so confident that you can just do that. Lead with your imagination, but the imagination only stays there for, like I say, the first tenth of a second, and after that, it immediately goes over. But you know that's going to happen, so you just do it. Now, that's a tool. But if you ask that same person to maybe do a crime scene, well, it's a little different. Because you don't have that tool that says, well, okay, I'll just, you know, I'll just look up, open my mind, and there will be the crime scene. Well, yeah, if you do a thousand crime scenes, yeah, that'll work too. But that's different than dead people. And just because you can do dead people doesn't mean you can do crime scenes the same way unless you practice at it. You see? So it's one of those things. It's not like once you do one thing, you learn to do them all automatically. Because what happens is you build certain confidence in certain tools and the ways you approach things. And that level of confidence just lets you shift from imagination to, to a real connection with the LCS instantly. You don't have to play any games or do any routines. You're doing, it's just there. Okay. But you have to establish that through a whole lot of doing it. 
you know, a lot of exercises. And then when you've established that, you do something different and you surprise yourself because you're not as good at it as you think you should be. You know, and it's because now you have to build that same level of confidence up in a different way, in a different scene with it, you know, so it's like different tools. So learning one thing doesn't necessarily make you really great at everything, even though it's the same basic skill in all those things. But you're dealing with your own mind and, and your own socialization as a, as a human being in, in human being society. And you're trying to control that. You're trying to suspend all the things you ever learned as a person and just let your mind open and be blank and get information with a very clear, focused you know, query. And that isn't as easy to do as it sounds. But the more you do it, the easier it gets. So that's what's going on. It's not the data is coming to you differently or you have to do special things for special cases. It just means that you have to practice until you build up your confidence to the point that it's just there. All you have to do is, is reach for it and it's there and it's always there. So it just takes time. And if you don't, if you don't practice it, you know, if you stop practicing it for a couple of years, it may take you a while to get that back. It's not that once you've got it, it's yours forever. But if you keep practicing, then you just keep getting better at it. Thank you so much for the answer. Uh, just a short, short, short uh, follow-up question about that. Is it a trap perhaps to expect visual data? Because remote viewing, the name remote viewing, perhaps is a bad name because sometimes feelings just come. You get the feeling mm -hmm. of stuff. Yes. Uh, it is it is a trap just to expect visuals. Now, if what, you know, remote viewing long, long ago in its nascence, you know, at, uh, what was it, the uh, uh, university where they were first coined the word remote viewing and the rest of it, you know, that was done because they were going places. I'm going to, I'm going to go drive to a particular place, or I'm going to give you coordinates to a particular place. So it always was about places and always places here on this planet, someplace not that far away. So remote viewing kind of grew up that that's what it was, seeing, seeing things with the eyes remotely. That's why they called it remote viewing. But then they realized that that was limiting. It didn't have to be places here. It could be places on the dark side of the moon or places in Alpha Centauri, or it could be places anywhere and that it didn't have to, it could be in the past and it could be in the future. And suddenly they learned there was just hardly any boundaries on it and that it had to do with feelings and all the kind of information that humans are used to, not just seeing. You could hear things, you could smell things, you could taste things. And so if you are, are, um, trying to get information, you're always not sure exactly whether that information would come better as a, as a smell or a picture. You know, hard to say. You may be looking for somebody who's hiding and you may smell the baking fresh bread. Well, all right, maybe they're hiding in a bakery someplace. You know, you, that's what you get. So the smell, if otherwise you just see somebody huddled up in a, in a room with there's there's four walls no windows and a door well that could be anywhere that could be anywhere on the planet or that could be anywhere on multiple planets you know that's not uh, that's not very helpful so sometimes the visuals aren't helpful sometimes what you smell is really more helpful than anything else so it needs to be multi sense you're just getting information it's it's all the information about this subject. And you'll get better at, at that too. Because yes, looking for visuals, sometimes visuals aren't aren't the key thing. Sometimes visuals have some information, but not most information. 
auditory or smell or taste might might uh, be a you know more useful than anything else or a multiple of those things you know you might you might see a room and all you get is is four walls and a door but then you might get the taste of beer and you might think oh okay there's some place that serves beer you know, and then maybe you just hear like 20 people talking at the same time and you say, oh, well, wherever it is, there's a bunch of people there, a bunch of people nearby. See, so now you've got some visuals, some hearing, some seeing, you've got all this stuff together and you're a lot better off than if you just got a visual. So don't think of information in terms of seeing pictures. Think of it in terms of just information. You got five senses and it could be all of those. And if you've been doing it visual for so long, you may just have to ask, and are there any smells that are relevant to this? Are there any colors that are particularly relevant to this? And you, know, you, you may have to ask those questions because your mind is just looking for a picture. Thank you so much, Tom.